Thank you all and welcome to our uh, PPMD's webinar series. Today we are, are thrilled and pleased to present Doug Ingram from Sarepta Therapeutics, who's going to talk about the future of precision and basically um, inform us about the PPMO for Exxon is 51, for Exxon 51 skipping and the portfolio that surrounds the PPMOs. So with that, I'd like to turn the uh, webinar over to Doug and we'll ask questions along the way. Welcome, Doug. Thank you very much, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to provide some information about our PPMO program in particular. I'll touch briefly on our entire pipeline, but I really focus on our, our PPMO program and then hopefully also focus very specifically on our current trial for the first of our PPMO programs, which addresses Exxon 51 amenable patients. So let's go to the next slide. So just briefly, this is our mission at Sarepta. As you see here, it says Sarepta aspires to be an important rare disease-focused company applying its expertise in precision genetic medicine to address neuromuscular conditions. And there are a couple of things to consider here, just so we're clear about what we mean by that. When, when we say we're an important rare disease-focused company, I don't want one to get the false impression that that is a, about that we are important, but rather that what we do is important that we don't lose sight of why we exist. Sarepta exists for one reason, and that is to develop therapies that bring hopefully a better and longer life to those who are suffering from um, genetic diseases and, and neuromuscular diseases, but very specifically, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One of the things you would know if, um, if you saw recent announcements from us is that we actually um, entered into a relationship with um, a company called Myonexus out of Nationwide to deal with another disease very similar to Duchenne muscular dystrophy called limb girdle disease. And then one might wonder what that means. Are we leaving Duchenne muscular disease? And I just want to be very, very clear to people. If you walk the halls of Sarepta, what you would see is nothing but, but through photographs and otherwise reference to our mission. We are a DMD company. We are focused on attacking this disease and finding ways to treat this disease for as many patients that have DMD as possible and as profoundly as possible. And if you look at our pipeline, you'll, that will explain the way we look at the pipeline and what we're trying to get done as an organization. So if you go to the next slide, that gets to this point. One of the things you'll see from us is that we have a number of different approaches to attacking Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We were the pioneers and remain the pioneers in this RNA-targeted therapy. A lot of people call it exon skipping, and I'll try my best to describe it without, um, without messing it up a little bit later. But we, we, are, we are really the pioneers in the use of RNA to treat disease, and we've been focusing all of that effort on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We also, in gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, down the road as well, you know, there's gene editing. So I'm sure many of you may have heard of this new exciting technology, future forward technology called CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9, and it's an attempt to actually go in and directly edit the genome itself. It's, it is a long-term research project that, you know, hopefully someday will provide benefit. We have a gene editing um, platform for Duchenne muscular dystrophy as well. And the reason I mention all of these, even though we're only going to talk about really in depth today, our RNA technology and PPMO, is just to make the point that I made on the prior slide. Sarepta's goal is to attack this disease and bring a longer, better life in any way possible. We, we are not arrogantly fixated on what we've done in the past. Our goal is to continuously improve and find a way to treat as many patients with as many different mutations and as profoundly as possible, and we, we are agnostic to how we do it. We will look for any therapy or any approach that has a chance of solving this issue. And that gets us to the next slide. This is our pipeline for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As you can see, there's, there are 16 programs, and then there's a research program as well, and that thing I talked about earlier called gene editing CRISPR-Cas9, and so you can see we have this RNA technology we have at the top. That's what we call our PMO. Um, that is our RNA technology that includes Exxonis 51, as well as Golodersin, which is for Exxon 53, and Casimersin, which is for Exxon uh, 40, uh, 45. And, and, and that's our PMO technology, and I'll touch very briefly on that along the way. 
And then that middle group, so if you click, you see that you'll, you'll, I think it'll get outlined. Um, that that middle group is our PPMO. So the, that's the program we're going to really talk about today. I'm really going to focus specifically on our current trial, but it really relates generally to all of those programs. Um, and that will cover, the, other than that last bit, that will cover 43% of children that have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, th then you'll see at the very bottom it says rare exon platform. So we have the opportunity at Sarepta, if the PPMO program is ultimately successful, to sequence and sequence PPMOs for you know probably nearly 90% of all of the the exons. The problem that we're going to have is that after um, after about those first top six. The, the populations really drop off significantly down to less than 1%, and we've got to find an approach from a literally from a purely regulatory perspective. We have to find an approach to bring those sequences to patients that need them, and we are committed to that. So we have already scheduled, we don't have the exact date yet, but we've scheduled a policy level discussion with the, the FDA and, and both the division and folks above the division at the FDA to talk through those issues. Assuming that we get some positive data on some of the exons that you see in here, how can we take that learning, sequence the more the rarer still exons, and find a way to bring those exons to patients that are waiting for them? So that is our goal, and you know we, we don't have the answer yet to that. We have some thoughts on it, but once we've talked through that issue with the FDA, we'll build that out, and we can come back and talk a little more about the future of the, even the rarer exons as well. So. Let's go next. So let's talk a little bit about what our RNA-targeted therapy is. So go to the next slide. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to, you know, I'm either, for some people I'm going to, I might be providing too much information, and for many people on this phone I'm probably telling you all what you already know enormously well, so I apologize in advance, but just let's make sure we're grounded about what exon skipping does. So what you'll see at the top is a normal dystrophin message, so the the way it works is the dystrophin gene expresses something called pre-messenger RNA, and it has both these things called exons in it, which are the things that code for protein, and it has these filler spaces in between that are called introns. And then between that pre-messenger RNA and the final messenger RNA, this equipment comes through and essentially cuts all the introns out. And when it does that in a, in a, a, a patient that has one of the mutations that causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy, that resulting piece of RNA, that mRNA, it has what's called an out-of-frame deletion. And you'll see, you can see in the second um, box, you know, a, a graphical representation of what that means. And it means that you'll see those things don't abut with one another. Um, and so what happens is when the machinery comes through to create the protein, it's making the protein, and then it hits that, that um, out of frame part, and it just stops making protein, and the protein that it did make just disappears. And so, some, someone very clever, and in fact, it's an individual by the name of Dr. Steve Wilton, who's a professor in Australia, figured something out. And he figured it out in part by looking at uh, patients that had something else called uh, uh, BMD, you know, Becker's muscular dystrophy, where they had in frame mutations, where the, the even though the protein was, was uh, truncated, it fit together, it figured out that if you could excise certain exons for certain collections of mutations, even though the resulting RNA would be truncated, the protein would still get made. It'd be a, protein, it'd be a, it'd be a truncated version of protein, but it would stay in frame, and it would actually get made, and then it would move to what's called the sarcolemma or the, or the, the you know, the, the, um, um, the outer wall of the muscle fiber, and it would act like a shock absorber. And as we all know, that's what dystrophin is. It is a sort of shock absorber that protects our muscles when we move them. So that's the concept of exon skipping. If we can find a way to X out certain um, exons, we can create truncated versions of, of uh, the dystrophin, both the dystrophin um, RNA and then the dystrophin protein, and we can actually begin to create some dystrophin in Patients who would otherwise have essentially no dystrophin at all and therefore no shock absorber. So the next slide. So the first therapy we have. So the therapies, our base therapy we have are things called the PMO. And it's, it's, uh, it's initials for what are oligos, morpholino oligos. And 
they are a really interesting sort of RNA. The way they work is we create essentially the mirror image of the exon that we want to X out, and they literally lay over that particular exon. They hide it from the machinery, and then when the machinery is coming through to get rid of all of the introns, it, it essentially, because it doesn't see that exon, it eliminates that exon as well, and it creates what is called exon skipping. And there are two really exciting things about the PMO. There's a really, really wonderful things. The first is precision. So we don't go and find the PMO. A lot of times drug companies essentially find a molecule out there, and then they test the molecule against different receptors, and they figure out if the molecule does something in the body. That, that is not the way our PMOs or even our PPMOs are here. That's not the way they're made. These are bespoke. They're literally built from the ground up piece by piece to exactly mirror the exon that they need to skip. So they're precise. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. In fact, we've tested this across a number of VPMOs and across many different studies. We have never had a case in which the exon skipping has, has, hasn't occurred in a child, in a patient that has one of our PMOs. So 100% of the time, they do what they're supposed to do when they get to the right place. They, they get to the right pre-messenger RNA, they X, on, they X out the right uh, exon, and they create truncated dystrophin, okay? The second wonderful thing about our PMOs is they're very well, uh, the, the, the safety profile and the tolerability of our PMOs are, are, are fantastic. So, you know, one of the, there's a number of different kinds of RNA technology that exists for numbers of different diseases, and there's a lot of excitement around RNA for a very, very good reason. A lot of RNA, um, while it does really good things, it has toxicity issues. So there are a lot of RNAs that have serious issues with safety and toxicity. And one of the wonderful things about our PMOs is that they really are very well characterized and very safe. Now, that, and they do a lot of good. But they have a limitation to them, and that's what we're going to get to with the PMO, PPMO, and how we're trying to solve the limitation. So we want to be fully transformative. We want to transform a child. And if, if you know, if as I say, um, our exon skipping, you know, works brilliantly and it's precise and it gets to the right, when it gets to the right place, it does the right thing and it's safe, then why are we not fully transforming every child so that, you know, every child can live full lives into adulthood and, and, and you know, you know, uh, you know, into old age. And, and the answer for that is that there is a limitation to these PMOs. They are neutrally charged. So there's a chemical issue here. They're neutrally charged. And, and, and because they're neutrally charged, they, they struggle to get into the cells. They don't get in the cells as well as other types of molecules may, may get in the cells. They do get into the cells, um, in, in some, in some just on their own and also because children with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, unfortunately, because they have damaged muscles, have leaky cells and they take advantage of the fact that the cells are leaky to get into the cells. So they do, but they don't get into the cells as abundantly as we would like. And so that big goal for us, if we're going to create a next generation version of our PMO, um, is to try to find a way to drag even more of our PMO into the cell. And so if you go to the next slide, that gets to the whole concept of our PPMO. And one thing I want to be very careful about is to make sure that we all understand that we have really exciting animal data on this, and we have really good reason to be excited and optimistic, but, you know, we are, we, you know, this is a program. And we don't have approved therapy yet, and so I just want to make sure that I don't oversell something. And I, I do have a tendency to get very excited about everything that we're doing. So I just want to make sure everyone understands what we do and what we don't know as we're kind of tracking forward. But let me tell you why we, what we're doing here and why we are excited about at least our program. So there, the, the, the PPMO versus the PMO is, there's an extra P on there, and that's because it's a peptide. And so what we've done is we've taken the same sequence of a PMO that does the exon skipping we just talked about, and we're attaching to it this cell-penetrating peptide, a specific kind of molecule. And what that peptide does, at least in our animal models, is it drags the PMO in much greater abundance into the cell. And so it's a carrier. It carries more across the cell wall of that PMO into the cell with the goal that if you get more PMO in there, 
You know, by our history, we know what's going to happen. We're going to get more exon skipping. We're going to get more, of a, you know, proper RNA that's, that's uh, skipped, and we're going to get more dystrophin, and then that's our goal. So that's our PPMO concept. So let's go next. So here's why we are excited about the PPMO from the preclinical data that we have right now, right? So, you know, we, we have done um, studies in – we've done studies in animals. So what you're going to see here is our animal-related studies. One of the – let me say for a moment, for those who may cringe to some extent about the fact that you have to use animal studies, it, you know, it is an unnecessary – I mean, it's a necessary but unfortunate part of drug development that you do have to test your your – uh, therapies in animals before you test your therapy, obviously in, in people, otherwise it would it would be you know wouldn't be safe. And so we have tested them. What we've seen is this: we've seen essentially that our thesis, at least in animals, works and it works quite well, both in mice and in non-human primates. We were able to achieve delivery to all of the important muscle groups in the animal studies. So it's not only striated muscle, not only the, the, but it's also the striated muscle in the diaphragm, which is enormously important um, for all the reasons you, you, you all understand to get the muscle of the diaphragm. And we also get it in the heart, in the cardiac muscle, and that's extraordinarily important as well. Obviously, if we can protect the pulmonary function and we can protect cardiac function, you know, we can do a lot of good in addition to protecting things like your quadriceps and your, your biceps and, and the like. We've also seen in animals that once we get it in there, it does induce significant increases in dystrophin levels versus the, the PMOs. And we have, at least in the mice models, um, great improvement in functions. One of the things I should note real briefly, I mentioned that we have, um, we've, we have we've done non-human primates and we've done mice. And one might, when you, I'm going to show you some slides. I'm going to show you some function in mice, and you might wonder why I'm not showing you the non-human primates. There is no such – what you need is you need an animal that has muscular dystrophy um, so that you can actually see function. If you don't have an animal that doesn't have, you know, that, that, that doesn't have um, muscular dystrophy, then there's no way to see function, obviously. They already have dystrophin. And non-human – there's no non-human primate that is a muscular dystrophy non-human primate. There are mice that, 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 are, that have muscular dystrophy, and that's why we can see it in mice versus non-human primates. So, just right. so Doug, the, the non-human primates are really specifically designed to test safety. They're designed to test uh, safety and exon skipping. So we can see – so we get to see two great things. Um, one is certainly safety, and that's extraordinarily important. In fact, you really want to see safety in the non-human primates before you move on to, to people, of course. And, and, but the other thing you do get to see is the exon skipping. Remember, there's two different tests that you do. I, as I mentioned, you've got this pre-messenger RNA that the gene creates. Then there's equipment cuts it, and then it becomes this final thing, which is the, the RNA, the messenger RNA, and it makes the dystrophin. Now, in a non-human primate, making dystrophin doesn't doesn't help us because the animal already has 100% dystrophin. It, does, it doesn't have muscular dystrophy, so you can't see anything if it's making dystrophin. But you can tell if it's if it's creating a truncated version of that RNA. It won't be meaningful to us because again, the animal already has dystrophin. But you can figure out what percentage of that that non-human primate's RNA has been transformed to a truncated. RNA, which if the animal didn't make dystrophin, would have been meaningful. And we do see a lot of really good, good. Um, as you'll see, we see a lot of great exon skipping in the non-human primates as well. And in your mouse studies, were you using a variety of, of MDX and, ver and other various uh, forms, like the DDA, or did you stick to the MDX? We, we use the MDX mouse, which has a, a which is exon uh, 23, if I'm not mistaken. Um, deletion. So we use that 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 mouse. And we've found it to be a really reliable model for you know predicting dystrophin production. Like it's what we use with the Teplerson, which worked really well. Um, it's what we use with Goladursin, which will work really well. So we think it's a very good model. Great, thank you. So the next slide. So what we see here is so this is exon skipping in in these monkeys. So as I said before, we don't see the we don't there's no good reason to, you know, there's no reason to look for dystrophin because they have dystrophin, but in the but in the monkeys you get to see what percentage of their um, 
what percentage of their RNA is being transformed into that RNA that would have made dystrophin. You know, it's called skipped, it's skipped RNA. And what you can see, you know, is something that gets us really excited about moving into clinical trials. You see that even even at very low doses, remember these are these are very low doses in one sense. These are moderate doses to low doses because human doses are lower than this. There's this thing called allometric scaling. So you take whatever you do in an animal and you actually have to apply a formula that's just to generally imagine what it would be in a human. And I think it's three to one or something along those lines, kind of in the three to one range. So what you see in in these non-human primates is you start dosing them, and right off the bat, at 20 milligrams per kilogram, you start seeing some some good exon skipping. At 40 milligrams per, per kilogram, you really see amazing exon skipping by histor- historical standards. But when you get up to higher doses, these animals, almost 100 in the skeletal muscles, as you can see in some of these muscles in the diaphragm, which is an extraordinarily important one for us, you can see that they have almost 100%, nearly 100% exon skipped RNA. What does that mean? It means that the, literally that the therapy has gotten to the right place, and as of all the RNA we've been able to test, almost 100% of it actually has been affected by the therapy, become that in what would have otherwise been in-frame skipped um, uh, RNA, and therefore presumably would make a truncated dystrophin. So that's great. Another thing you should see is this, if you look across, really focusing on the heart. I mean, all of the muscles are, of course, important, but the heart's a really important one. One of the things I will tell you is that the PMOs really struggle to get into the heart. So when we look at the PPMO and we see at the highest doses a significant amount of exon skipping in the heart, that gives us a lot of, of um, it's very, very uh, encouraging for us as we think about the future. The other thing I would mention is the, the um, so, you know, so look across the bottom, as I just said, you know, obviously it's very dose dependent, so the higher the dose we can get, the better, um, and that's one of the things we're going to be looking at in our study. But another really good thing is that these animals tolerated the dose even at higher doses, and none of the, these, none had to stop um, due to safety issues. That's really important to us, because as you can see up there, this is a dose dependent issue. If we can get the higher doses, it looks like in humans this could really be something, you know, important. As I've mentioned before, we know that the PMO itself is a very well-tolerated therapy, and it is our goal and hope that the that the peptide attached to it won't change that safety profile, and it will continue to be very safe. And it's very encouraging to see that in animal models, which are very, you know, generally are predictive on the safety side, that it looks very good. And I will also say. We did a lot of, we've done beyond this, just to give people some comfort. And we've done, I think, by now, four separate non-human primate studies on safety at very high doses, higher than this. And we've done it uh, very frequently, much more frequently than we would imagine the therapy would be, we would, would be given to DMD patients. And the good news is it looks like we will have the ability to dose this at, at the right level Without, without having to worry about pulling back because we had a tolerability or safety issue. So, so far, so good on, on that issue. Next slide. So this, in, this, in a mouse, now we're going to a mice model because we get to now see what it might mean for dystrophin expression itself. And what we're looking at here, if I'm not mistaken, is immunohistochemistry. So what immunohistochemistry is, is you take these gels and what you're looking at, the circles that you see are literally muscle fibers. And so we take a cross uh, section of a muscle fiber, and then through this you know complicated process that I would do a horrible job of explaining to you today, yeah. we do this immunohistochemistry that, um, that that creates a luminosity when dystrophin exists, when dy- dystrophin is present. And so that anything that you see on this slide that's green is dystrophin. And, and more important still, as you'll you can see, seeing dystrophin at the at the circle line. Is important. What that means is the dystrophin is at the sarcolemma, which is the cell wall, which means it's acting like a shock absorber. So it's very, very important to see that. It would be much far less important if we were just seeing dystrophin sort of floating in the ether. And getting at the sarcolemma is important. So let's tell you what you're looking at here, because there's two big things here that get us excited about moving into the clinical trials. If you go to the bottom, so on the left, that says that's a it's an MDX mouse, again, and I apologize for 
telling everyone what they probably know intimately, but MDX means a multi, you know, means a, a, a mouse that has muscular dystrophy. So this is a mouse that does not make um, any amount, any real amount of dystrophin, and that's why if you squint really hard on the the um, on that, you will note that the you, you can maybe see a little bit of green somewhere, but generally speaking, the MDX mouse makes no dystrophin. And on the right, what you see is you know a mouse without muscular dystrophy. This is this looks like a slightly frankly it looks like a, like a fainter slide than I think it probably should. I, I suspect you should see a little bit more green there than we see. But but WT means wild type, which is what scientists call um, animals that don't have the particular disease state that they're studying. So WT means um, essentially just means a mouse that doesn't have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And of course it has the it has uh, the green lines associated with having dy dystrophin. And again, I, I want to be clear in my picture here as I look at it, I, I suspect it should be a little more green than that. I don't want to create the impression that that you know these, these wild type mice should be have should have full dystrophin everywhere. But then let's look up at the upper let's look at the top from left to right. So this is a single injection of a PPMO. So we created a PPMO specific to this mouse so we could drag the um the more PMO into the um, to the mouse and then do exon skipping in the hope that we would actually transform the amount of dystrophin that a mouse has. And as you can see, at seven days, they have an enormous amount of dystrophin. That's a fantastic answer for us. What's also fa interesting is at 30 days, they continue to have a significant amount of dystrophin. 60 days, still have a ton of dystrophin. That's not really a scientific term, but that's what I would call it. And then, of course, by about 90 days, it, they still have dystrophin, and it's beginning to wane. But there's two things to really um, to notice here. The, the, the first thing that's, that for us, you know, really gets us hopeful about our program, of course, is that we are creating significant amounts of dystrophin, at least in a mouse, in a mouse model. The second thing that's great about this is that, as you can see, on a single injection, it's really you get out to almost 90 days before the dystrophin begins to deteriorate, which, of course, you'd expect it to turn over and eventually deteriorate. And the great thing about that is that it, that it, it means it's very likely that we can not only create a therapy that creates even more dystrophin than we already create with PMO, but also that we can create a better dosing regimen for patients, which would be significantly better and, you know, and, and, a, and a lower burden for families. And obviously, that's an enormously important thing for us. As, it, as for those, I'm sure most everyone knows, but today, Exodus 51 is a weekly infusion. We, you know, it, we'll find out in our trials if we're correct about this. I want to really be tentative about some of the things I'm saying. But at least based on animal models, it is our goal, uh, and we believe based on the studies, that we probably have a therapy that is a monthly infusion as opposed to a weekly infusion, which obviously would be, you know, in addition to the dystrophin, would be really important for families. Yeah, Doug, that would be spectacular if it was less frequent, that's for sure. But can you just give us a sense of, in, in the animal studies, in, in this case the MDX, what was the dose? Uh, what was the dose? Was this the highest dose, um, as you've shown before on your earlier slide of 80 mg per kg, or how was that adjusted for the mass? Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know the exact dose. I suspect if we're showing this, it's probably at the higher, it's probably, if not the highest dose, one of the higher doses. That would be my I, – I don't, unfortunately, apologize, but I don't have that in front of me, but I, I suspect it would be one of the highest doses because this is really – this is really significant expression. I'm sure it's on the higher side. Right. It's incredible. And, and it was given IV to the – to the, the mice were infused? I think this was – is it – I think it's infused through the tail. Yeah. So it's an infusion, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a full body infusion. I think it's full body infusion through the tail. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, so that is our so our target profile then will hopefully be a therapy that you know again if if it required weekly infusion and we could get this much dystrophin, obviously that would be that alone would be a wonderful thing. But if we can also have this and do it on a monthly basis, the amount of um, you know, burden for a family that's already dealing with a lot of burden would be, be enormous. So we recognize the value of that. We're fighting for that. Yeah, absolutely. So then let's go to the next slide. So, oh, and then, okay, then let's go to the final thing. So that's, so we create dystrophin, and then we did one final thing, which is, was it meaningful? And again, in, in these mice models, 
there's two different tests. There are different kinds of function tests that these, um, that these mice go through. One is a grip strength test. What's another thing called rotor rod, which is a little bore you, but it's a, it's a certain kind of test that, that, that relates to the function. And you can see, again, in the mice models at least, if you go to the far left, that yellow is the WT is wild type, meaning a mouse that doesn't have muscular dystrophy. The very next one is, is MDX, which is a mouse that does have this particular deletion, so it has muscular dystrophy. And it is not surprising, of course, that the function of the mouse is significantly lower for one that has muscular dystrophy than a mouse that doesn't, otherwise known as a wild type. And then what you see is you begin to dose these animals up as you can see, I think this is repeat dosing. I think this is weekly repeat dosing, if I'm not mistaken. What you see at eight weeks to nine weeks is, you know, as you dose up, you begin to get significant uh, restoration of function. And, you know, as you can see at the highest doses, you literally are getting function that is, was it one dose? Am I mistaken? Apologies. This is literally on a, at a single dose. It surprises me, to be honest. That's, that's okay. So, a single dose. So what you can see is uh, function is restored at the 40 and 80 milligrams. That is literally equivalent to um, to a, a mouse that doesn't have muscular dystrophy. They actually look slightly, even slightly higher. I don't believe that's statistically significant. So I think it, I think it is actually full restoration to wild type mouse. Again, I don't want to suggest for a moment that, and these are all very statistically significant for the for those who are interested in, in the whether there's the statistical significance associated with the study. They were greatly statistically significant. Um, I don't want to suggest this will perfectly match what we're going to see in humans, of course, but you can see why we got excited enough to go at risk with multiple programs. So, next slide. So, this, so our first study is 5051-101. This is a PMO for exon 51 amenable mutations. As you know, that's about 13% of patients that have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It is exactly the same sequence as the Teplersen, except that it has the peptide attached to it to increase um, the you know, dragging more of it into the cell. One of the questions I'll answer in cases people are curious about, sort of how do you choose which therapy to go for which? Uh, I'll, I, I'll tell you, the, you know, to be direct, that we are going as fast on everything as we can. So I, I joined the company in literally June of 2017. We picked this program up and said we need to move as fast as we can with everything. And what you're going to see is that the you know we're at 5051 in the clinic first only because it was the first one we could get to the clinic. We're doing IND enabling studies for other ones, and we'll show you how those are going to roll out. And they're not being sequenced in any way. If I could have them all in studies right now, I would have them all in studies. But unfortunately, some work had not yet been done, and so we're getting all that work done. So, you know, frankly, we're not prioritizing one over another. We're trying to move all of them as fast as we possibly can, just so, so we're aware of that. So um, going to the next slide. So broadly speaking, hopefully people understand. So we just talked about the left box, preclinical studies. So before you're allowed... To move into patients, you've got to do a bunch of preclinical studies to support the thesis, and of course that makes tons of sense. First, you've got to make sure that the that therapy is very likely safe, so that you're not putting patients in undue you know risk or at harm. You know, one of the we, you know our whole goal as a, as a company is to bring a better life to people. The last thing we would ever want to do is to actually you know put people in a worse position than they are. So of course it's really valuable that we do preclinical studies and that we have a good basis to believe that our therapy is going to also do good as well. So we've done all of that. And then we have early clinicals and then late-stage clinicals. In rare disease for us, we try to move very fast. So there's there's very little daylight between our early clinical studies and then moving as quickly as we can into pivotal studies, late, later-stage studies that get the, these therapies out into the community and to patients that are waiting for them. So let's go to the, the next one. All right. So here's here are our, you know, our study objective of our first. So our first study is what is called a single ascending dose study. So it is a safety study. Before we can move on and do uh, other studies, we have to really make sure we know what the the maximum tolerated dose is for our study. This study, you know, frankly, is is a very conservative study in the way we approach it. 
because, as I said before, we've got to make sure that we're very thoughtful so that we don't put people in undue, undue harm. And so it is a slow escalating study, and its goal is to evaluate the safety and tolerability of, of, our, of our therapy. And then um, the second is, of course, we do what's called pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, which really, you know, gives us a better understanding exactly about how the therapy works and how it, um, uh, how it works in the body. And then we do need some, we need, you know, there's exploratory work here, which will give us some inf additional information and confidence around exon skipping and dystrophin levels and, and the like. <clears throat> Great. Going on the right side, then, is the enrollment criteria. One of the things I'm going to say for those who um, who look at this and wonder why sometimes the enrollment criteria looks very um, restrictive sometimes, and unfortunately, it's just an unfortunate aspect of drug development. One of the things we've got to do is be very thoughtful about the way we run our studies so that if the drug is working, we actually can see that it is working. That's the best answer for patients down the line because the, the you know the best thing that can happen out of a study if it's going to, if the therapy is beneficial is that we get it to physicians and, and to patients who are waiting for it. One of the biggest, you know, one of the saddest things about a study is a, what's called a false negative, which is you've done something in the study that um, masks the performance of the therapy. The therapy could have brought lots of great benefits to patients, but because of that, the study looks like a failure and it doesn't get out to patients. So just so you understand why there's sometimes enrollment criteria that are that are that are strict. So this, we're looking at ambulatory and ambu non-ambulatory um, boys ages 12 and above. We actually are doing some additional tox work when that finally comes in, uh, which will be in the next couple of months, I think by July. Then we're going we're gonna to amend the IND and go even younger um, as well, but for now that's what we're allowed to go to. Stable dose of, of steroids for 12 weeks or, or no steroids for 12 weeks uh, prior to screening. Um, no exposure to a Teplersin or just a person for six months prior to screening. Um, I wonder if you could sir, explain to us about stable cardiac and pulmonary function. What are you asking in terms of stability? Are there, uh, um, are you looking for ejection fraction? Are you looking for uh, an FEC in, in terms of a certain level? So what mm -hmm. are you thinking in terms of stable cardiac and pulmonary function? So I don't, I know there's a very specific standard. I'll get that to you so you have it. You can, you can give it to them and, and, their position will happen as well. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, and, as uh, Siobhan rightly notes, and they can call the investigator who has, who has the standards. Well, I apologize. I don't have it right, right at my fingertips. That's really right. fine, as long as we can answer those questions for the community, and certainly it will be um, with their clinician as well. Great. All right. And then, then, then let's go to – so this is the very basic – this is a graphical representation of the basic study, and then I'll show you what we're doing to provide a benefit as well to patients. So this is it's what's called a single ascending dose study. The goal in the, the initial study is really all safety and then some ancillary things called pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. It helps predict what we're going to do in the multi-ascending dose study. Each patient, when you're in the study, you get one dose of this therapy. Now, don't worry, you'll get other doses, but I'll explain that. But in the actual study itself, you get one dose. We started, we started very, very low doses, very sub-therapeutic. Why? Because this is a safety study, so we need to be very thoughtful. We take a dose, we look real carefully, then we move to the next dose, we slowly move up, so we get to a dose that begins to get into a therapeutic range. And this is, there's essentially three patients per group. So that's kind of the concept. Then you'd say, well, if I'm a patient, you know, what, how am I going to benefit on my side from this, so, you know? other than generally helping to move this therapy along. And the answer is that there is an open-label extension study. You'll see at the bottom of this slide it says the protocol is currently under FDA review because this open-label extension we just submitted. But I can tell you that, I, I, that the, FDA is not, the FDA is not only amenable to this, they strongly encourage this open-label extension study. The FDA and the division strongly want to ensure that patients that are in studies like this, and in our study in particular, also get a big benefit from the from the therapy if the therapy is working as well. So what happens here is you'll you'll in the main study you'll have one dose and as soon as you have the dose you move over into this open label extension study, you'll get on 
It's monthly right now. You'll get on a monthly dose of therapy, and then as we learn about the therapy and the doses go up, you'll go up as well. So you'll begin to go up as we get in, you know, informed and know the safety and, and, and we start escalating. You'll escalate as well, and you'll escalate all the way up to you know, the highest possible therapeutic dose that's safe. And then you'll we'll continue even beyond that. You'll be in a long-term extension study beyond that as well. So, um, so that's the that's the the opportunity here for patients that are um, that are excited to get in a study study like this. Doug, if if I'm in the study, or if my son is in the study, or or the, the person I love is in the study, um, are you by? I know you're looking at safety, and and you're looking for the therapeutic dose, the um, maximum toler tolerated dose. But will you biopsy these individuals or some of these individuals to understand expression? Yeah, there'll be one. There's only one biopsy. Again, we got to be. We really want to be thoughtful about biopsies, given that it's a safety study. We don't want to overburden people. So there'll be one biopsy, um, as you can see right here. And it, I think it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's four weeks out. Yeah, so four weeks out, you'll get one biopsy. It's a needle biopsy, so it's you know it's not an open biopsy like you know um, trials historically were. So it's a needle biopsy, and then that will be your biopsy. Right. So all people at week four in the process. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There's no baseline biopsy, just that one four-week biopsy. Great, thanks. All right, and then and then this is the you know this is essentially the in broad strokes the patient experience in the trial. So you'll you'll there are five total visits. You have a screening visit. Then you'll have, you know, a week one visit where you go on site. You can see it will take about three days. You'll have a week two visits one day for a couple of hours where you'll, you know, they'll take, they'll collect some things, urine and, and some other, you know, lab collection. Week four, you'll come in. You'll have the needle biopsy. They'll collect a little bit more information, do a physical exam. And then uh, week 12, will be the end of your study, and then they'll take some additional, you know, physical exam, you know, height, weight and height and the like. And then you will go right from there. You will go on to an open-label extension study. You'll begin to get dosed on a monthly basis, and your dose will be escalating, again, as we are informed by it, and it's safe to, do, to increase dose. You'll get dosed up like everybody else. And then these are the clinical sites. We intend to add additional sites as soon as we can. We're working hard at them. But you can see these here. I think these will, I presume these will all get posted so that people don't have to, you know, furiously write all of this down. But these are the sites that we have at present, and we're continuing to work on sites. I'm getting some, it's pointing some, oh, people, yes, okay. <laughs> people are, are, they are miming to me to also mention you can go to the clinicaltrials.gov site. The reference to our particular study is in the parenthetical at the very bottom of this slide, and you can go there as well to get all of this information and, and some of the other information I've already provided to you today about the study. The so study. basically, though, in the open label extension, it is estimated or, or believed to be a monthly uh, dose of this product um, once the study completes and they're in extension, right? That's what, that is our current, that, that's what we currently believe, believe to be the case. That's what you'll start doing. If it turns out that we find later on that you know every other week would be beneficial, more beneficial, then obviously that we would we would switch to that as we kind of as learning goes. But based on animal models, our current working assumption is that you will only need one dose a month. Great, thank you. So next slide, and then one other thing you should know: there's you know we all we have there'll be you know very likely for a lot of people there's travel. We want you to know that we will pay for all of your travel. So between your home and the study site, it is covered. I'd like to also note that it's not just you. You, the patient I'm speaking to now, for those patients also up to two family members can travel with you. And we, you know, travel with, we, we try to make it as easy as possible. We partner with a travel vendor. So we'll manage the reimbursements for your, you know, meals, mileage, parking, you know, tolls, um, so all of that. So we, we, you know, hopefully we, we do everything that we can to make your participation in the trial um, as as, as uh, seamless and as easy as it can be, consistent with being on a trial. 
Uh, your your plan here looks incredibly thoughtful, Doug. Uh, as you might imagine, there are international folks that are listening in on this conversation, and yeah. um, it, it's always as an international patient, would I would I be able to be screened for this study? What would that mean for me? Could I continue on extension? Um, and and how do you feel about that at the moment? The goal, the the, the, the danger and risk of a of an international patient just flying in for the study is that. We want to keep them in a long-term extension aspect of it. So my my hope would be that that you would be getting in a study that's just you know that's in your home country. We are working hard to get sites open in other countries as well. So right now you see you see only sites in the United States. That's simply for speed. They're the first sites we could open. So you know we're trying our best to to, to move. Um, outside the United States, into Europe, and even beyond Europe as well to get sites open. So my hope is that we'll actually have some sites in other countries as well for for patients that are waiting for therapy in other countries. Great, thank you. And there's um, okay, and then so 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 this is uh, so here's where we are. We're actively enrolling our first study, the one I just talked to you about, and you know what that's about. Um, and then we're going to offer this open label extension, and then from there, what's, what's in the next slide? Cause I, I, I may just speak this. Oh yeah, and, this, and here's where we're going. And so, so for so our goal, of course, is to move as rapidly as possible. First with our that PPMO, and then the others to obviously to uh, you know ultimately an approval from the FDA, and then hopefully beyond the in the rest of the world to the extent you know fully extent possible. Uh, our goal is to move from the single ascending do dose as fast as possible to a multi ascending dose study, and then hopefully getting enough data down the line to, to get an approval from the FDA, and we'll get more guidance on that once we see what we're seeing in the safety study. And then, so you know, we're also moving as fast as we can on the other exons I just talked about, which here are 44, 45, 50, 52, and 53. As you know, that's about 43%. And, you know, they are, we'll get our next IND should be, uh, our next IND to start our next study should be in the fourth quarter of 2018. And then I think we have two more in the first quarter of 2019. And again, for those who may wonder why are you staging them the way you are, the short answer is that really we're not staging them. If I could, if I could have six, you know, patient trials right now, we would be doing it. It's just happened to be when, when I, Came into the company and we took a careful look at how we could start accelerating this. This was the this is where each program happened to be, and so we were able to move fast on 51, and now we're moving as frankly we're moving like mad on every other one to try to get INDs in place for all of these therapies and get them to patients as fast as possible. And then of course the final future I've mentioned at the beginning I'll mention again. This is 43 three percent of patients. And, and, you know, I, hopefully anyone who's heard me speak before will hear me say over and over again that, you know, we, we are committed to trying to get therapies for as close to 100% of DMD patients as possible and to create therapies that are as profound as possible. We don't believe in, we don't believe, you know, there's a certain percentage that's good enough and we don't believe that there's a certain amount of transformation that's good enough. And so that explains PPMO, but it also explains that last issue, which is we're going to go to the FDA, we're going to sit with the FDA, we have the benefit of some language, some, some, some congressional language, we frankly architected some time ago, that gives us the basis to have a discussion about uh, a faster approach with the rare exons, and so we'll have that meeting, I don't have it, it's, it's, it has been asked for, and the FDA has been very amenable to having it. I don't want to create the impression that they're disagreeing. They they are very open to having this discussion. We don't have it scheduled yet, but I think it will be scheduled in the next 60 days, and we can start getting some insight into how we can get PPMOs developed beyond the 43% and to as close to 100% as as, uh, as science will let us let us get. Yeah, well, it's wonderful to know that these next exons are expected in the near term. Um, you know, near term is yesterday for all of us listening on the phone, but certainly by 2019 to move forward. Um, uh, and I guess if, if you could sort of dream with me about the future, um, should you see in this, in this safety study, in dose escalation and the biopsy, significant expression of dystrophin, is there a vehicle or a plan that you could go to the FDA and demonstrate this and, and how quickly could we see this um, come in the market as a second generation and then 
um, invite the people that are or, or make the enable the people that are on Exondus uh, 51 to roll over into this. In this so new, I don't I don't have the exact I don't have an exact timeline yet because that is the vagaries of this single ascending dose. But I will tell you this. You know, we went to the FDA in February, as you know, to talk about golodersin and whether we could use dystrophin yet again as a surrogate endpoint. You know, so the fundamental question was, was the Sondus 51 and the use of, of dystrophin as a surrogate endpoint, was that just a unique event or does the FDA see the possibility of using dystrophin as a surrogate endpoint in studies going forward? And the answer was they do see that as a precedent. They do believe we can use dystrophin as a, as a surrogate endpoint. So our goal in the U.S. in particular, and then we'll have to make sure we have a program to get the therapy in the rest of the world as well, but, in, but, but at least as it relates to the FDA, we can use dystrophin in the surrogate endpoint. So my goal is once we see good expression and we know what a therapeutic level is, remember, we're not just, this is not just a regulatory process. We're really learning along the way. But when we know that we have a therapy that's at the, that's at the maximum tolerated dose and we know, and we know that we can do it once a month, then our goal is to run this out for a year, take a baseline and a 12 month biopsy, and then hopefully based on that, go to the FDA, and ask for an approval with, um, you know, with a confirmatory trial. And the very likelihood is we'll have already started a confirmatory trial because we're going to want to find a way to get this therapy approved in places that don't use surrogate endpoints like, like Europe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you, in our last few minutes, if you could go back to slide 13, I have a question on, on slide 13 related to dose. And in that slide 13, unless I, unless I uh, misread it, it looks like that, um, is that where we are? It's slide 13, sorry, 1-3. Okay. We're on slide 20. Got it. I, I mean, the good news about this slide, it shows that you're uh, affecting not only skeletal muscle, but cardiac muscle and, and also smooth muscle, which is really, really critical, as as you know, that a lot of um, individuals with Duchenne have some significant smooth muscle um, uh, issues. But I see in the 40 milligram per kilogram dose, you you have very little cardiac, in, you know, cardiac um, expression, and it went way up with the higher dose. So is, is this uh, um, is this concerning to you, or it, do you feel like this was in terms of the model used? Maybe it's less difficult to get into the human cardiac muscle than it is uh, um, the mice cardiac muscle. It's an interesting. So it's an interesting issue. The problem we don't we can never fully know because we we don't know in humans about the correlate in human heart. There's no way to test for it, obviously. Uh, we know that this is, so ironically, this is encouraging for us. And the reason it's encouraging for us is because in the, with the PMOs, like, and just remind you, there's been a lot of therapies that have tried to show expressions of dystrophin. The only ones that have ever shown dystrophin is, are our PMOs, Teplersin, Golodersin, hopefully Casimersin when we get to blind it. But, but even they have struggled to show anything significant in the heart. So what's encouraging, 40 is not encouraging, but the fact that at 80 we get up to, you know, literally about 60% exon skipping in the heart is really encouraging for us. Um, and 80, per, 80 milligrams per kilogram is not 80 in a, in a, a human. Uh, this is a mouse model, so it is, uh, no, this is a non-human primate. This is a non-human primate. So it's a significant, you know, it's significantly lower than this. So this, this is actually encouraging to us. I'm not showing you this, but in a different, I do have another. It was a it was a different sequence. I suspect it just maybe the vagaries of two studies, but it was actually even even more powerful on this. So I'm not. I would say generally we're just very encouraged at the 80. It is surprising that it pops up so much between 40 and 80, but you know we've never seen this kind of expression um, in the heart before with with uh, with any any kind of morpholino or or you know. And certainly, just a person was unable to show anything like this either. So, so it's actually encouraging for us. Okay. No, to, I, I don't disagree. I mean, the PMO just didn't get to the heart at all. But I, I yeah. saw such a dramatic yeah. difference in the 40 to the 80, um, which all of us listening would like the 80 uh, in terms of 60% expression would be incredible and preserve these young hearts. Um, it, yeah. There's a considerable jump as well in the in the smooth muscle between 40 and 80. So, it, you know, yeah. I, I think. Hopefully that success of that safety study where you're going dose escalation and getting a therapeutic dose would be terrific and certainly gain confidence about the expression in the heart and smooth muscle, which we would be thrilled about. 
Well, yeah. I, we have a few minutes. I'm, we do have some questions that can, have come in on gene therapy, and I recognize that this was really about the PPMO, and the faster you go, the happier we'll be, Doug. So, uh, and especially as as you move this one forward to move the other exons and, and reach out to other countries, because, you know, as a mom sitting in the U.S. with the opportunity and a mom sitting in Lithuania without the opportunity, it's, it feels pretty heartbreaking, as you might imagine. So just to wrap up, there are questions about gene therapy. I think we need to do another webinar, but I'll just ask a brief question. Um, in the nationwide study, four children have been treated. They are all very young. They are all very young four-year-olds. Um, all of them have been safe. So one of the questions came in about Therepta uh, um, as you think about this particular option, as you described early on. You, they're asking about... Um, are you prepared to go forward? Are you prepared in terms of a uh, vector facility to, to be able to develop and deliver um, vector to a study? And then how fast can you move there? On, on gene therapy. Uh, the short answer is we're doing – so we have, a, we have an analyst day on June 19th. So we're driving to a, to a, a full R&D day there where we're going to talk about all of these programs, including gene therapy. And one of the things I've committed to is before June 19th, before or at June 19th, we're going to provide an update on where we are from a manufacturing perspective. Let me give you um, the short answer without the detail because we're still in the middle of some negotiations. We have a very aggressive and ambitious regulatory and development strategy to try to get gene therapy to in the United States and in the rest of the world as fast as possible. And we've married to that a very aggressive and ambitious manufacturing strategy. And we're working with partners and bringing in internal expertise even as we speak. And I am very confident that we, if we are able to get to the, the, um, to get to the approval with the speed that we're envisioning, which is very fast, that when we get there, we will be fully prepared to serve the the population without a problem with gene therapy. Now, this, this, that's a that's a pretty audacious statement because you know one of the things one ought to know with respect to gene therapy is that if one really envisions they're going to serve the DMD community with gene therapy, as it stands right now, to the best of my knowledge, that requires the development of more gene therapy manufacturing capacity than exists in the entire world. And yet I'm telling you that that is our goal and we're going to get there. You know, there's two things that you need to do that. One, you need investment. That is not a problem for us. One of the things I did last year that I think surprised the external world at the time, but I think people are starting to wake up to understand the reason, was I went out and raised a ton of money. I raised $1.1 billion. And people were trying to figure it out because they were imagine they were looking at us kind of the way you would normally look at a company financially, and they were looking at us the wrong way. We have a mission. And our mission is to bring a better life to kids with DMD. And we're not going to be limited by money in doing that. So we can fully invest in the manufacturing to get this done. And the second is expertise. And as you'll see in the next month or so, we're bringing in an enormous amount of expertise around gene therapy generally and gene therapy manufacturing specifically. So between that expertise and our investment, I'm very confident that when when and if we're able to get the gene therapy to work and we're able to, to get it approved by regulatory agencies, we'll be able to serve this population and bring that gene therapy to the population. And that goes to another issue, I think, that, that had been raised at one point. You know, there was a time in this company's history as it relates to our RNA technology, and I know our colleagues in Europe really felt this in a painful way, where this company didn't have enough supply at times to fully serve the market in clinical trials and otherwise back way back some years ago. Just to give you comfort, that is not an issue today. We have the ability to serve our populations across all of our RNA technologies. If our PPMO is approved, there will be no issue ensuring that we have adequate ample supply to make sure that everyone gets the therapy they need if we can get it approved and and, and reimbursed and the like. So manufacturing will not stand in the way of serving the DMD community. That is absolutely wonderful to hear, really wonderful to hear, and, and we're, we're with you and anxious to see this come forward. Um, um, so vector production has been a problem, and, and as you know, um, it, it is expensive. So 
I'm really glad that you're creating uh, partnerships both internally and externally or bringing expert expertise internally and creating partnerships externally to make sure that the issue isn't the production of uh, clinical grade, grade virus as, as gene therapies come on, online. Um, one last question, and this gets back to the PPMO, is are, do you see any immunogenicity to the, to the peptide? Um, is there anything to worry about with regard to that? Um, in, and have you seen that in the animal model? No, we've seen we've seen in the for the PPMO we've seen no immunogenicity, none. In fact, we're trying to, we try to create some some antibodies to use that require sort of inducing some immunogenicity, and frankly, we struggle to create it because we just can't get an immunogenicity to uh, at all. So it's, it's it's with our both our PMO and our PPMO, in, immunogenicity has never been. An issue, and then I don't believe there'll be any issue going forward. Great, thank you. Well, Doug, thank you. We've come a little over our hour. We certainly appreciate your time expressing dystrophin via your RNA technologies, or again in gene therapies, is fundamental for our uh, the boys and for any carriers that might be manifesting carriers, and certainly for this community. We so appreciate what you're doing, and we wish you Godspeed. And thank you again for doing this webinar today. It is much appreciated by our community. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about this program. We're really excited about the PPMO program, as you can hear. We hope that people who are amenable to being in the trial reach out to the clinical investigators um, to see if they can be in it. Obviously, we're excited about that. We're very pleased to be a, a partner with PPMD. We touched briefly on gene therapy. We'll talk about that maybe in more depth at a future day. But one of the things one, everyone on this call should know is in addition to the wonderful work that our friends at the Nationwide have done, Dr. Jerry Mandel and Dr. Louise Klappick, uh, we're very proud of the fact that one of the earliest investors to push this thing forward to these kids uh, were our colleagues at PPMD and, and Pat Furlong. So thank you very much for all of your, all that you do for this community. Thank you. We'll see you in June at the conference. Thank you.